Yamuna Tira Vanachari Yamuna Tira Vanachari Jai Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jai Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jai Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jai Mr. Pad Paramahansa Padutika Acharya Ashtoto the Sri Srimad, His Divine Grace, Srila A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada Ki Jai. Iskan BBT Founder Acharya Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Jai Mishnu Pad Paramahansa Padutika Acharya Ashtoto the Sri Srimad, His Divine Grace, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur Ki Jai. Ananda Koti Vaishnava Ki Jai. Nama Acharya Srila Haridas Thakur Ki Jai. Gantaraj Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai. Samaveda Bhaktivinoda Ki Jai. All glories to the assembled devotees. All glories to the assembled devotees. All glories to the assembled devotees. All glories to Sri Guru and Gauranga. So, Jamal handled the, the uh, batteries and that left us without the verse. Is the verse coming? Just now coming, okay. Narayanam namaskritya Narang chayva narotamam Devim sarasvatim vyasam Tato jaya mudiriyet Before reciting the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is our very means of conquest, we should offer our respectful obeisances unto Lord Narayan, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, unto Nar Narayan Rishi, the supermost human being, and to Mother Saraswati, the goddess of learning, and to Srila Vyasadeva, the author, and to Srila Prabhupada, the translator, commentator, and our spiritual master. Nashta Prayesha Bhandreshu, Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya, Bhagavat Yuttama Shloke, Bhakti Bhavati Naishtiki, by regular attendance and classes on Srimad Bhagavatam and by rendering devotional service to the pure devotee, all that is inauspicious within the heart is destroyed almost to nil. And loving devotion to the Supreme Lord who is glorified in transcendental songs is established as an irrevocable fact. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya On this ninth day of February 2020 in San Diego, we're reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, translation and commentary by His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. Canto 4, The Creation of the Fourth Order. Chapter 22, Prithu Maharaja's Meeting with the Four Kumaras. Text number... 22, 24, 24, I'm sorry. So we read this yesterday, but we'll read it again today. I'll just do the translation and pick up with the purple where we left off. Ahingsaya padamahangsya charya ya Smitya mokunda chadita gryasiduna Yamara kama and yamais chapyan indaya Nehi nidi yad one with the tixe yacha. A hing say ya, pardon a hungs ya char ya ya. Smith ya mokunda chaditag ya seed huna. Yamar the kama near my champion in the ya. 
निदीह या द्वंद्व तिक्षया च अहिंसया पादमहंस्यचर्यया स्मित्या मुकुंदा चरिता ग्यसीधुना यमार कामाय नियमाइश्चाप्य निंदया नदीहे याद्वंद तत्क्षे याचा अहिंसया पारमहंस्यचर्ये या स्मित्या मुकुंदा चरिताग्यसीरुना यमार कामाय नियमाइश्चाप्य निंदया नदी है याद वंद तो तिक्षे याचो अहिंसे या पाद महंसे चाये या स्मित्या मुकुंदा चरिता ग्यसीरुना यमार कामाय नियमाइस चाप्या निंदया नदी ही याद वंद तो तिक्षे याचो यू वन ट्राई सेंटर्स अहिंसे या पाद महंसे चाये या स्मित्या मुकुंदा चरिता ग्यसीरुना यमार कामाय नियमाइस चाप्या निंदया नदी है याद वन बत तिक्षे याचो अहिंसे या पार महंसे चाये या स्मित्या मुकुंदा चरिता ग्यसीरुना यमार कामाय नियमाइस चाप्या निंदया नदी ही याद वंद तो तिक्षे याचो। You want to try? No. Can you do those curtains for me? Thanks. All right. We did the synonyms yesterday. I'll read the translation again. So this is Sanat Kumara speaking to Maharaj Pritu. A candidate for spiritual advancement must be non-violent, must follow in the footsteps of great acharyas, must always remember the nectar of the pastimes of the supreme personality of Godhead must follow the regulative principles without material desire, and while following the regulative principles, should not blaspheme, blaspheme others. A devotee should lead a very simple life and not be disturbed by the duality of opposing elements. He should learn to tolerate them. Picking up the purport, where we left off. So Prabhupada is systematically going through all of these prerequisites to advancing in devotional service qualities that devotees should have or cultivate. It is also stated in this verse that one can advance by controlling the senses. I'm sorry. Did we do this one? Yeah. It is also stated in this verse that one can advance by controlling the senses, yamai. By controlling the senses, one can become a Swami or a Goswami. One who is therefore enjoying this super title, Swami or Goswami, must be very strict in controlling his senses. Indeed, he must be master of his senses. This is possible when one does not desire any material sense gratification. If by chance the senses want to work independently, he must control them. If we simply practice avoiding material sense gratification, controlling the senses is automatically achieved. Another important mention, uh, point mentioned in this connection is anindaya, we should not criticize others' methods of religion. There are different types of religious systems operating under different qualities of material nature. Those operating in the modes of ignorance and passion cannot be as perfect as that system in the mode of goodness. In the Bhagavad Gita, everything has been divided into three qualitative divisions. Therefore, religious systems are similarly categorized. When people are mostly under the modes of passion and ignorance, they're their system of religion will be of the same quality. A devotee, instead of criticizing such systems, will encourage the followers to stick to their principles 
so that gradually they can come to the platform of religion in goodness. Simply by criticizing them, a devotee's mind will be agitated. Thus, a devotee should tolerate and learn to stop agitation. Amen. Another feature of the devotee is nirihya, simple living. Nirihya means gentle, meek, or simple. A devotee should not live very gorgeously and imitate a materialistic person. Plain living and high thinking are recommended for a devotee. He should accept only so much as he needs to keep the material body fit for the execution of devotional service. He should not eat or sleep more than is required. Simply eating for living and not living for eating and sleeping only six to seven hours a day are principles to be followed by devotees. As long as the body is there, it is subjected to the influence of climatic changes, disease, and natural disturbances, the threefold miseries of material existence. We cannot avoid them. Sometimes we receive letters from neophyte devotees questioning why they have fallen sick, although pursuing Krishna consciousness. They should learn from this verse that they have to become tolerant, dvandva tatikshaya. This is the world of duality. One should not think that because he has fallen sick, he has fallen from Krishna consciousness. Krishna consciousness can continue without impediment from any material opposition. Lord Sri Krishna therefore advises in the Bhagavad Gita 2.14, Tam Tatikshasva Bharata. My dear Arjun, please try, please try to tolerate all these disturbances. Be fixed in your Krishna consciousness. Om Jnana Timurandasya, Jnana Anjana Salakaya, Chakshu Unmilatam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha. I was born in the darkness of ignorance, but my spiritual master should have but opened my eyes with the torchlight of knowledge. I offer my humble obeisance unto him and all members of Sri Parampara. So, uh, here the Sanat Kumara is defining qualities that are necessary to cultivate for a devotee. You may notice that his whole instruction is more or less on the practice of devotional service. He's not really talking so much about the soul, you know, explaining the, the constitutional resistance of the soul and Krishna. Uh, it's all about the practice. Um, because he's speaking to Maharaj Prithu, who's already very, very advanced. And uh, time is short, and so he's come to the point of practice. You see what I'm saying? He doesn't have a wide audience here that he has to start with the ABCs. He's already come to the uh, Abhideya platform of the three, of the Sambandha, Abhideya, Priyojana, uh, divisions of knowledge concerning devotional service. Sambandha being, who is God? Who am I? What is this world? What are the relationships? And on the basis of that knowledge, then you know what to practice, which is Abhideya. And so the practice includes, as we've been reading in this uh, verse and purport, a whole lot of uh, uh, things that we, that we should try to do and things we should try to avoid. This is, uh, he began with describing it should be nonviolent. Well, nonviolent is kind of a moral principle. I mean, the Buddhists specialize in that, you know, but they're not worshiping Krishna. Uh, it's, 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 it's simply a uh, an indication of your, well, of course, devotees base their absolute uh, principle of uh, nonviolence on their understanding that there's a soul in every in every body. So even an ant, even a you know a bird, every, everything should be dealt with gently. And as Prabhupada points out uh, here and in the Bhagavad Gita, there's a proactive element to it. Ahimsa means no nonviolence. So that's a negative thing. If you just sit in the room, you don't do anything, you'll be nonviolent. But that's, in Prabhupada's uh, ultimate definition, that's violence. Because you're not helping anyone to be Krishna conscious. Yeah. You're not, you know what I mean? You're, 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 not, you're, not, you're impeding, this is another thing, you're impeding their progressive march to, back, to, back to Krishna. So Ahimsa has, has of course, an a, a, a element of not doing something, not causing any harm but it also has an important element of trying to give them the ultimate benefit that will re relieve all their suffering forever. That's why Prabhupada would say that uh, if you want to uh, do you know, actual welfare activities, then you should try to spread Krishna consciousness. Because 
any other welfare activities basically on the plant from a body and of course mind also, and people, you know, hotlines to avoid suicide and things like that. But that's all temporary. It's a big, uh, it's off the point because no matter how you help people, you know, with, with some material uh, benefit where the, their body will be saved or will be, you know, more healthy or more educated or something, the time will pass and they'll die and they'll, they're still in the, into the, the, the material uh, ocean of birth and death and the forest fire of material life. So real nonviolence means, of course, it means not to be uh, unnecessarily violent toward, any, toward, every, toward anyone. Sometimes violence is necessary, as on the battlefield of Kurukshetra, Prabhupada you know, explains, violence is not an absolute principle, but the default for devotees, don't hurt any creature. Un unnecessarily, it's not, you know, it, it, that's, that's given. And especially, you know, other human beings, the cows, animals like that, especially the cows. So that's, we went through that, and then following the footsteps of great acharyas, this is a essential principle if one's, one wants to uh, advance. Uh, smritya, remembering the activities of the Lord, the nectar of the Lord's uh, pastimes, which includes name, form, qualities, pastimes, and instructions. All those need to be heard and remembered. Yamar, self-control. Akamar, trying to be free of material desires, uh, strictly following the rules and regulations. So that's a broad spectrum. And that, of course, it all requires knowledge. You have to cultivate knowledge. What are those rules and regulations? You know, and, and when you hear them, the, the, us, the usual, uh, the, the default for a materialist is to reject them. You know, as soon as they hear the four regular principles, uh, many people say, well, that's not for me. You know, I go to some other yoga group or something. I want to be, I want to be spiritual, but that's a bit too much. But if, if you really want to achieve the final goal, all of these elements are necessary, absolutely. And anindaya, uh, without blaspheming. Now, it's interesting, that's actually where we started here in the purport. Prabhupada uh, gives that in terms of don't blaspheme other religions, right? Don't criticize un other religions. Now, you'll find in Prabhupada's book, sometimes there's some <laughs> criticism. Uh, mostly he criticizes how they practice it. They're not actually following, especially, you know, the Christians. Mostly on this principle of nonviolence. You know, thou shalt not kill. Well, how many times did he you know, discuss that? Even with priests that would come and, and meet him, and he would stick on that point. You know, how come you were supporting uh, cow slaughter when Lord Ch uh, Chanya says, thou shalt not kill? And the result of cow slaughter, which is war. The war is, there's always some war either threatening, just happening, or, you know, the, the war clouds are, and that now we have this forever wars. The United States is, 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 is you know, waging in the Middle East and Africa. It's, it's insane. In the name of Christianity, you know, we were a Christian nation. Nation. So that kind of hypocritical of uh, following that is, you know, that is uh, worthy of criticism, but not uh, generically. In other words, the, it, there's different modes of nature, and people are in different, you know, their religions also reflect that. Uh, so, but we know that in the Bhagavad Gita, if you're in the modes of nature, then to, to progress at all in yoga, uh, especially bhakti yoga, then you have to rise up from the mode of, mode of passion, ignorance, and mode of goodness, and then try to get to the of, platform of pure goodness. This is a basic principle, because uh, you become more and more awake. Your, your consciousness is more and more uncovered, even in the mode of goodness. Now, the problem is the mode of goodness is never purely demonstrated in this world. There's always, in the people who are pr predominantly tending toward the mode of goodness, they have periods when they're more in the mode of passion and ignorance. There's always a vying for influence in your mind because everything's in flux. Unless you're you know, firmly uh, uh, devoted and absorbed in thinking of Krishna as lotus feet, and, and, you know, then, you're, then you're subject to these waves of the influences, the, the, the sangha that you may have, not just human sangha. You know, what's the music that's coming at you? What did you eat? You know? If you're in the mode of goodness, you're eating, you know, very, very frugally, you know, vegetarian food. Okay, that's great. But then you, you know, something comes along. There's a party, and you indulge. You know, even vegetarian food, you eat like too much. 
and then you're suddenly in your mode of ignorance, you have to sleep more, you know. So that's, uh, if the restrictions and the rules for every part of your material activity is a foundation for the, the advancement in devotional service. That's why Prabhupada started these ashrams. He knew that someone, you have to live amongst the devotees and, in, and, and the, the predominating um, uh, ethos of, you know, of, of the culture has to be defined by the Shastra and by the realized soul, by the, by the guru. And then there's a chance of actually anyone being purified. This was the, the, what Prabhupada kept emphasizing, how powerful Krishna consciousness is, that if you take it seriously, it doesn't matter where you're coming from. You know, Narada Muni with the hunter, we just heard about Jagai Madhai, Prabhupada's proof, you know, you know spaced out hippies who've been you know, living un uncontrolled lives and everything actually becoming self-controlled devotees by the power of the, the, the hearing, the pure sound vibration, both the instructions from the Shastra, from the Guru, and chanting the holy name. The holy name of Krishna is Krishna, and Krishna is the greatest purifier. Pavatram Paramam Bhavan. This was the realization of Arjun. Remember, after the, uh, we should study this. There's four verses in Bhagavad Gita, which are said to be the four key verses, 10, 8, 9, 10, and 11. And when Krishna goes through you know, there's, there's an element of the Sambandha Vidaya Priyojana there. I don't know if you've ever realized that. The first two lines of the first verse is the, is the Sambandha part. Uh, everything is uh, emanating from me. I, 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 I have created everything. Everything is emanating from me. Now, that's not an exhaustive ex explanation of the material energy, but that's the essential fact of it, is that Krishna is the source of everything, including all these energies, including ourselves, and uh, that's the, the basic uh, Sambandha platform. Then comes Prayojana. Uh, the intelligent who understand this fully worship me with all their heart and in, in intelligence. So they're now we're already on, on the Abhideya platform. And how do they do it? The whole next verse is describing how uh, the basic uh, essence of how one worships Krishna and, and serves him. The first thing is always place their mind on me. Machitta and Matagata Prana. They're all their life force and their activities are dedicated to me. They're absorbed in thinking of me. They're absorbed in serving me with all their activities. Katabodhiyantak parasparam. And they get together and they glorify me. And uh, they speak about me. Just like uh, the classes and uh, so many other instances. And what is the result of that? Katayantashtamam nityam, always think, is, uh, chanting my glories. Tushyanticha damandicha. They enjoy spiritual pleasure and they're nourished by that uh, talk. Now on his side, what does Krishna do? Now you get to the Priyojana. Tesham satati yuktanam bhajatam priti puvakam dadami buddhi yogam tam yenam amapiyantite. I'm not just a passive observer here. As, when they're serving me like this and always linked to me in yoga, I give them the intelligence. I enlighten them from within because he's in the heart, giving the intelligence by which they can come to me more and more. Sati buddhi yogam tam yena mama piyantite. And then even more personal, tesham evan akam paratam, out of compassion for them, I, with the shining lamp of knowledge, destroy the darkness of ignorance in the heart. Now Arjun's response to that, we all chant together, param brahma, Param Dhamma, Pavitram Padamam Bhavan, Purusham Shastratam Divyam, Adi Dev Majam Vibhum. So he accepts everything Krishna is saying here. This is where, that's part of the next verse, I think. Uh, but here he's defining the Supreme Personality of God. You are the Param Brahma. We are Brahma. Aham Brahmasmi. We're all spirit. That's the first lesson, right? But not Param Brahma. The Supreme Brahman, the Supreme Absolute Truth, Spirit, is Krishna. And Param Dhamma, the supreme abode of everything. You know. Uh, Param Dhamma Pavitram Paramam Bhavan. And this was at the point I made from this, this passage here. You are the supreme purifier. Krishna cannot be contaminated, just like the sun. Probably give the example of the sun. There's some impurities, some uh, dog urinated in the corners, you know, outside. And then the sun shines on it, and after a while it's all dried up and pure. The purifying power of the heat and light of the sun is compared, but Krishna is like that. 
if we simply let that sun of Krishna rise in our heart, you know, by chanting and hearing and focusing the mind, controlling the mind, putting it back on Krishna, and doing our activities for Krishna, we become purified of what? Of all of the inauspicious things. Lust, anger, greed, illusion, envy, madness, and intoxication. All of these things become dried up. They're, you know, it's, it's possible. So that Pavatam Purusham Shashadam Divim, the eternal divine person, Adi Devam, Ajam Vibhum, you are the origin of all the uh, Devas, you are the original God, uh, unborn and very powerful Vibhum. So uh, Krishna is responding uh, proportionally to our approach to him. And part, part of the, the approach is just, you know, these accepting these principles. This is one of many such verses in the Bhagav in the Srimad Bhagavatam, in which there's a list of things we should do and, and not do. And one is not nindaya, to not agitate the mind. Prabhupada says your mind becomes agitated if you go start railing against Christianity and Islam and all of these different things. Plus they start railing at you, maybe throwing a few bombs. What's the point? You know? There there there's a kernel of genuine spiritual truth in, in all these main religions. But, we, but we, we, have to, we should be examples to show how a, a true religious person is uh, tolerant, is uh, you know, appreciative, and, and, and ready to... to uh, like I remember this one incident. <laughs> we used to go out on Harinam every day in, in uh, New York when I joined. So we went downtown, or midtown, different parts of Manhattan. So Macy's, which is now dying because of Amazon, like many other big uh, you know, stores like that. But they had a major presence right in the middle of, of Manhattan. I forget what street it was, 36th Street or something like that. So we used to chant in front of there. you know. And there's a, probably most of you don't know Manhattan, but there's a street called Broadway, which goes diagonally. Most of the streets are north, south, east, west. This one goes diagonally. So in, in, in cutting these streets, there are little uh, parks, you know, the little, the little triangular part, you know. That. So I was, I had been chanting for some time, I wanted to take a little prasad, so I went and sat on a bench, and I was taking a little prasad. And here comes this, these are the days that the black Muslims were very prominent, you know, so they, they didn't like us so much. So he, one guy comes in, who are you worshiping? I said, Krishna that you should be worshiping Allah, you know, it was something like that. It was, kind of, it was kind of belligerent, you know, I'm sitting there on the bench, he's towering over me. And so I, uh, I started saying, well, tell me about your Allah, you know. <laughs> I figured I'd get him to glorify, you know. So he was telling me, he's so great, and this and that, you know. I said, oh, that's like, my, my Christian is like that too. You know, keep telling, keep glorifying, you know, I want to hear about it. <laughs> that softened him up. You know, he became less religious because because just the very fact of act of glorifying the Lord enlivens the heart. You know, you be, it be cure, purifies. So I got out of that difficult situation because nobody could see me. You know, I, he could have been going to beat me up. Anyway, <laughs> so ahimsa, you know. So these are they related to each other? Ahimsa anindaya. You know, not blaspheming. Now, of course, there's a whole other element of blaspheming, which is blaspheming our own devotees. That's, you know, we, we say that every morning, that's the, one of the main uh, offenses against the holy name. Now, why would that be an offense against the holy name if you're blaspheming some other devotee? Because uh, the holy name is not different from Krishna. So if, you, if, if you're blaspheming devotees, Krishna doesn't like that at all. You know, you can easily lose your taste for Krishna consciousness, which means lose your taste for the holy name. You know, you were chanting nicely. There's another little vignette. Some of you may have heard this one before. So back in the, uh, the 70s, in, I was 75, 76, 77, I was in L.A. And uh, I was a senior devotee. I joined in 73, and this, I was three years devotee. So they gave me a little uh, uh, assignment to help work with the bhaktas. You know, I like to do to give them classes and things like that. So they knew me, you know, and I was watching out for them. And so one bhakta, I forget his name, I'm sitting on the front steps of the, of the L.A. temple after, after class, and he comes up and he sits down and he's in great distress. He says, you know, I, I had a fight with bhakta so-and-so, 
and now I, I don't, I don't want to do Krishna Kandas or anything like that. I said, oh, that's very bad. You have to go and, and, and ask his forgiveness, you know, bow, bow down, because he kind of, he, he hit him, you know, physically. And so I have to, you have to try to, you know, get his forgiveness, and then Krishna will forgive you, and you'll get your taste back, basically, I was telling him. So the next day I asked him, well, how'd it go? He said, well, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it, you know. I couldn't bring myself to do it. And this poor kid, you know, he never got back into the thing. He just lost the, uh, the, the, the mercy, the blessing of Krishna to become attracted to him. We have to remember that every ounce, every bit of attraction that we have to Krishna and the, the ability to practice Krishna kind is coming from him. He's blessing us with that. And uh, the, when he sees that we're discordant, that we're you know, uh, uh, criticizing, blaspheming his devotees, he'll um, withdraw that. And, and the result was we'll have to leave the association. It'll be very uncomfortable to be amongst the devotees when you know that, when, when you don't have a taste for Krishna consciousness and you feel, you'll inevitably feel uncomfortable, even angry like that. You know? And that's how Krishna removes us. So very, very, be very much careful. Don't blaspheme and criticize you know, the other religions and don't blaspheme devotees. Now, Nuriheya, Prabhupada says, this is a simple living. Now, he relates that to, say, I think, taking sannyas, right? Um, controlling the senses, anindaya, and nirihaya is simple living. Nirihaya means gentle or meek or simple. So we're trying to, trying to uh, uncomplicate our lives because all of that, you know, you're, when your life is complicated like that, you're trying to maintain a certain uh, level of material opulence or whatever, then your mind is, is always agitated, you know? And uh, especially today with, with, you know, the social media, where you can, if, if you try to, to meet some kind of standard on there, you, you, you're bound to become depressed. You can never meet it. You know, the, 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 it, it, the whole thing is geared toward making you dissatisfied with your present condition. You know, and it's just madness. So the more that we can, we can uh, uh, not do with, you know, the less we need, we feel we need in the material world, the better off we are in Krishna kindness. Because we're trying to cultivate this uh, really uh, subtle sens sensibility for that which is, you know, after all, beyond our ability to see directly. But, so that requires uh, that we don't get distracted. It's just, it, the material world is just a big distraction. It, it, that's what Maya does. She distracts you from Krishna. Try to get you absorbed in the, in the dualities of this world. You know, this is the source of fear. As soon as we get absorbed, we're forgetting Krishna. We're actually, you know, safe at his lotus feet. But we forget his lotus feet and we come and try to dominate this world and become fearful. Bayam, pratiya binaveshatak, syad. It's a very important line in verse in the 11th Kano. Bayam, syad, comes into being when we become absorbed in the dvitiya. Dvitiya is the second thing, meaning the material energy. And, and that requires isha to petasya, to turn away from the isha, the, the Lord, turn our back on Krishna. Uh, and viparhiya, everything becomes upside down. Instead of being servants of Krishna, which is our natural position, we feel we're masters of the material energy, masters and enjoyers. Viparhiya, asmati, and you forget all your entire spiritual life and you become identified with this temporary material body. So the whole thing is, is, a, is a big distraction. I was thinking, uh, I don't want to forget this, so make, next time maybe I give Sunday feast. You know, uh, many of you, if not all of you, have probably heard that on death row, you know, there's a death row in, in, in most major prisons, right? So when it finally comes that day when, when you're going to be uh, executed, they let you have your choice of meal, right? You can, Right, this is all your last your last meal, and you can order up your know, favorite thing. I'm sure there must be restriction because some of these meals can cost five hundred dollars. But uh, okay, you know, let me have uh, lasagna, you know, milkshake, whatever they pick. So what what is going on there? You know, is that there's there's a little bit of compassion there. You know, it's probably a law uh, <laughs> that uh, here's somebody who's going to die. We're going to you know he's going to die. Let him have a little something, you know, so he can deal with all of the anxiety and everything and give him a little, uh, you know, pleasure in the last, last few moments. So I was thinking that 
we're all on death row. I mean, we're all going to die, right? We're all on death row. And so all of this sense, sense gratification is like the, those last meals. All of this, it's, 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 a, uh, it's a facility for dealing with our mortality and the fact that we're all doomed. Uh, and to, so we will forget the actual implication of it. You know, everything that really it's, it, the whole thing is pointless and, you know. So every, it's all like that. So Krishna consciousness is all about facing the reality and dealing with it. And that's why Krishna says, Janma, Mitya, Jana, Vyadi, Dukkha, Doshana, Darshana. That one of the elements of knowledge upon which your Krishna consciousness is based is to, to be very sober and see the evils of birth, death, old age, and disease. I like to give the order. Birth old age, disease, and death. That's actually how you experience them. And what, so, so what should that, you know, if, if, if that's all you're thinking about, then you become a fatalist and, and you know, a, a depressed or a total hedonist. No, this is part of a whole series of, thing, of knowledge. Understand that that's your situation in the material world. If you don't develop Krishna consciousness, then your fate will be again and again to face those things. And most people don't know anything about the previous birth or the next birth. That's the, that's the, the biggest illusion. And so they, they reconcile and say, okay, you know, I know I'm going to die. Everything is fair. So let's enjoy as much as possible. The, hedon this, the hedonistic conclusion. But that's, that's fatally flawed because you're going to go through it again. And, you, and when you're a hedonist, that means that you become very sinful. You suffer way more than just the ordinary person. So that's not a solution. So being uh, gentle, meek, or be, living simply... Robert gives this nice little formula, plain living, high thinking. High thinking there means cultivating Krishna consciousness. Plain living means keeping body and soul together. Don't ex ex be extravagant. You know, if possible, don't go into debt. You know, that's such an agitation for the mind. Do you know that there's a huge mountain, of like over $200 trillion of debt, of, of government, banks, personal, all over the world, just in America, they, they, they keep piling up. The, these poor kids come out of college. You know, they work so hard. Their parents slaves. It's so expensive, and they, they borrowed so much. They have a thirty, forty thousand dollar debt to pay off with interest. You know, oftentimes they can't pay the principal. They just keep paying the interest, being interest. And this is going on in America today. Imagine the anxiety of that. You're supposed, to, you know, if so. So that that's a uh, a sign of living beyond your means, right? When you when you go into debt. So it's such a blessing not to be in debt, you know, to live a simple life, a renounced life. Just get what you need, you know, and then spend the saved time and, your, and the calm mind in chanting Hare Krishna and practicing Krishna consciousness. It's, a, it's a, uh, a very, very important principle. And it's the ideal there in simple living is, of course, the uh, sannyasi or the Goswami. Uh, Prabhupada mentions that. One can advance by controlling the senses, and uh, one who is therefore enjoying this super title, Swami or Goswami, must be very strict in controlling his senses. Now, you know, having read Prabhupada's books for so many years, I can, you can see some of the history in ISKCON being reflected in the purports. By this time, fourth cano, letter fourth cano, some of his sannyasis had left, they had fallen away. And so he's already had experience. That's why he's giving this. If you have the super title, Swami and Goswami, you have to <laughs> be very strict in controlling your senses. This is possible when one doesn't desire any material sense gratification. Well, you know, we do desire it. That's, that's our conditioning. How to tamp down that desire and, and uh, control the senses over time? It's not just a question of one day or a week. You know, it's forever. So that's, uh, as you will explain in the subsequent verses, by cultivating the, uh, and previous verses, cultivating attraction for Krishna chiefly through hearing and chanting. It's all a question of the mind. If the mind can be saturated with wonderful uh, thoughts of Krishna, just like we had that beautiful festival on Friday in the evening, you were here, right? Yeah. So all of that chanting and dancing and seeing the deity and, and the bathing, you know, the little slideshow, all of that, and the prasadam, Nobody is thinking, what time is it? I've got to go you know, see a movie. Everyone who was there who took the trouble to come on Friday, they were relishing. <laughs> and that's how you, how you control the senses. You engage the very senses which are your enemies if they're trying to drag your mind into sense gratification. 
to become your best friends by seeing the beautiful form of the deity, the ears by hearing the sound of the holy name, beautiful kirtan, the music enhances it, and uh, of course the tongue by tasting the prasada and speaking about Krishna chanting, hearing chanting, hearing chanting. So that's, the, that's the, the only way to control the senses. It can't be done just on the negative side. Just, just by, I won't, I, won't, you know, I won't see any beautiful thing, I won't hear any beautiful sounds. I won't, you know. It doesn't work like that. Because deep inside, we all have a spiritual form, sarup, right? The definition of mukti is muktir hit banyata rupam swarupena vivastati. So mukti doesn't mean just to lose your personality and merge into Brahman forever. That's, fal that's a false sense of mukti. It doesn't last, ultimately, according to Bhagavatam. But uh, mukti defined here it is one of the ten, ten subject matters of uh, the Bhagavatam. Hitva anyatarupam, to give up other forms, like this one. And we've had so many other, even in this one lifetime, we have so many forms. As we get older, you go through the, so many forms, it changes. And we've had unlimited forms. So give all those up. In other words, we're going to give them up one way or another. But uh, to transcend them and be situated in your actual swarup of the soul. Swarup means the actual form of the spirit, whether it's a cowherd boy or a cowherd girl or a cow or something like that. Fully conscious, doesn't matter what form you're in. Uh, and then you're situated eternally in that. You're, you're completely satisfied. So in this lifetime, we're meant to cultivate our knowledge of that. That's part of Sambandha, actually, to understand our relationship with Krishna in more and more detail. What is our form? What is our, our service? How do we dress? You know, there's an identity. That identity doesn't change. So that's real mukti. So how to, how to develop that means to develop our attraction for Krishna, for thinking about him, speaking about him, serving him, glorifying him, uh, in every way, staying in contact with Krishna through the service. And then it's possible to live a very austere life. The perfect example is the, uh, the Goswamis, the six Goswamis. The famous verse, four, number four. Jagva turna mashesha mandala pati shening sada You know that one. Uh, so they're describing especially the three uh, sannyasis, uh, Rupa, Sanatana, and Raghunath, Das. Chaktva Tunam. Now this is, you know, every word is so important. They gave it up quickly. They didn't think, okay, you know, this is a gradual process. I've got $10 billion, I mean, whatever they had, he had a whole boatload of gold, the savings of Rupa Goswami. Sold so many millions of today's dollars. And he said, gradually, gradually, they'll give it. No, no. Chaktva Tunam <laughs> means immediately, without delay. Not only money, but influence aristocratic relatives, all kinds of you know, pomp and circumstance that they were in. Raghunath Das was like the only descendant, the only child of billionaires, but would be billionaires today. So this is ideal renunciation. If they can give it up, you know, that's the example. So they, uh, they, they gave it up permanently, Sada. Uh, as totally insignificant. All of that wealth and all of that influence and everything. When they, when they met Lord Chaitanya and surrendered to him, and he instructed them go to, go to uh, Vrindavan, you know, especially. Bhagavan Das eventually made it to Vrindavan. He came to Puri. They had lost the, any attraction for it. And they saw the evil of it. So they give it up completely. So what did they do? They didn't just go to Vrindavan. Uh, Bhutva Dina Ganesha Ko Kadanaya Kopina Kantashita. They became Dina Ganesha for the sake of the wretched souls who have no Krishna consciousness. They started writing, they were preaching, and they eventually built temples, but they were dressed in old garments, even you know, more. Uh, <laughs> in other words, they picked up this and that and nothing. They just had loincloth and uh, that's. Uh, Kantashrita, uh, they took shelter of the whatever they could find, you know, from the, the greatest silks and, and diamonds and all kinds of jewels they were wearing in the court of the Nawab, uh, they gave that up, you know. Uh, out of mercy, for Karuniya, Kopina, out of mercy for the fallen souls, they did all that. So, what was this state of mind? Prabhupada points out in a uh, lecture uh, here, he's again and again. 
that uh, when the war, when World War II came, Prabhupada lived through World War II in India, and I don't forget, the British were uh, with the Indians, that was the British Empire, and Japan was right there, so Japan bombed India because it was putting part in the whole thing. So, and there was all kind, you know, war just up, uproots uh, an, uh, uh, a great upheaval in any society. So, some people became very rich during the war, and some people became very poor. So this, he describes one guy who had been rich, and because of the war, and you know, he, his, he, he became a pauper. He couldn't live. He committed suicide. Just like during the, the, the Great Depression here in the 30s, you hear the stockbrokers jumping out the window. You know, in the 20s, the roaring 20s, stock market's going up, just like today. It could happen again, believe me. And, and, and uh, you know, everyone was making money. And, like, and then the crash happened in the 29, and suddenly you were worth a million dollars, now you, you, you owe a million dollars. So it's like, you can't stand it, you know. I, I, and so they jumped out the window. So, but, but, the, but the Goswamis, they voluntarily did it. So what was their consciousness? Everything is in the consciousness. So the third line gives Gopi Bhavada Samatabda La Havika Lola Magno Mahur. They were the most wealthiest because they were experiencing at every moment. They were diving and surfacing in the ocean of Gopi Bhava, the, the, the highest mellow of devotional service for Krishna, tasting nectar and agnanda at every moment. Magno Mahur, again and again diving in that in that ocean. That's what they were experiencing. So they didn't at all miss any of that wealth. They said, good riddance, you know, that's a distraction. So that's real nariha, simple living. And it's also this uh, other thing, this giving up any tinge of material sense gratification. You know, the, that, the material sense gratification is what's, that, that's the anchor that's keeping us from really moving very rapidly on the, on the path of devotional service. The things you're hanging on to, that's described in the Ten Offenses. They could maintain material attachments even after understanding so many instructions on this matter. So that, those material attachments, we, this was discussed recently, uh, they, they get fed. You know, you're chanting, 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 but there's that one material attachment. So that becomes much more powerful than it used to be. That was one amongst many. Now it's the one thing you can't give up and just find it even harder to give it up. So, so Krishna consciousness is a science and all of these uh, elements that Sanakumara is giving are very valuable, and then uh, to become tolerant. They go together. They're to be uh, renounced and self-controlled and merciful, you have to be tolerant, because if you're going to try to help people and you're going to try to live in this world, uh, it's going to be difficult. Things are going to, you know, disease is going to come, you'll be attacked, so forth. Um, so that dvandvata tikshaya also has to be there. That's the flip side of uh, giving up material, at material attachment, and the other side is giving up uh, the fear and the uh, disturbance that comes from things not going according to your plan and whatever, you know. So all these are really great instructions and we should try to follow them. Any c comments, questions? We have a mic. Mother Heather. I'll call you Mother Heather from now on. On the bus yesterday, I heard exactly what you said. There was a kid talking on his phone, saying, I don't know what I'm going to do about these student loans. I'm trying to come up in the world. I'm trying to get this over with, and I just can't get on top. <laughs> okay? There you go, realization. Y yes, and I also think that's one big hustle, but that's another story yeah, for today. Totally. Uh, yes. And also, it's funny about, I'm glad that you said that the way to get to control the senses, and I'm not claiming mine are, is just to engage them more in things with the temple or Krishna consciousness, even if it's just on the physical plane, here's the sweets for the deity. Because when I read Vivekananda's book about how great yogis are controlling every organ individually, I'm thinking I don't have a chance in hell. <laughs> um, sort of. So I felt really happy that you said that, and it gives me hope. And also, about the possessions and things. Possessions? Oh, possessions. Well, yes. Yeah. Like, I have three. Not, be, not being possessed. Right, not being possessed. Yeah, I but know. but you if we can. think we're this body and we think we need three bags, then I have a bag that thinks it can't take the three bags. Then I have to hide two of the bags because I can only walk around with one of the bags. <laughs> And now it, it's interesting. You become entangled. Yeah, yeah. Yes, and I I see what you're saying because 
it's it should be easy just to drop it all, just be in the now and just yeah. try to react to what's coming. But my mind is always going, oh God, and then I'm scrolling around and scrolling around, and what am I going to scroll around tomorrow, yeah. and how am I going to get out of this? Okay, thing? Heather, we got the point. Sorry. Yeah. So, the, so the solution for you is to always chant Hare Krishna. Try to always chant, either you know out loud or in your mind or in your lips. Okay. Oh, we have a comment over here. Namadar Kumar Prabhu. Thank right. you for explaining so beautifully the renunciation of Srila Bhagavad Swami. You know, I was just thinking, it's, it's sometimes it's, it's interesting how like we hear things many times, but then when we feel really connected, like we may hear a certain verse or someone may say some quote and it just hits us at our core and it's like, and immediately we, we understand it's how profound it is and you know the epiphanies the realizations just come and it's like so right now I'm just like really appreciating you know like the the example of, of Sri Lupa Goswami yeah. and um, you know here's a person who, who had it all you know everything that people strive and are willing to die for yeah. and um, and then just just some modern day examples of of many of the the saintly people who, who come from you know just his Grace Garanga Prabhu from Ishkar Garanga, Chapati. Yeah, and Chapati, yeah. You know. you know, so like um, one devotee was glorifying him and you know, he was saying like he, you know, he's, he's graduated from MIT, one of the most prestigious universities in the world. And, um, and then he's given up jobs at Google and Microsoft, you know. You know to, so here's somebody who had, who was something, and he went from something to nothing. He's just mm -hmm. a simple person to be a monk. Same thing with His Holiness David Ramita Swami. Yeah. Came from a very wealthy background, graduated from Yale University, but didn't pursue call. I didn't pursue a high-end job. He just now he's a monk. He's a, so it's um it's interesting seeing that that example it gives it gives us something to strive for and really put things in perspective. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we're going to end with one verse by Rupa Goswami, and show where his mind was at, and why he was able to. Uh, so he says, uh, he's praying to Krishna. We can pray like this. Bhujanga, just listen to the Sanskrit, the sounds. Bhujanga, the Pachandaka, Spada, the Kanda, Chudanka, Re. The Dankrishna, the Ganchada, Brahmana, Badna, Bringa, Brahme. Patanga, the Hitustati, Vanakati, the Kedi, Priye, Padas, Spada, the Me, Mahus, Tri Mukunda, Shuddha, Rati. So what to pray for? He's giving us instruction. Like Lord Chaitanya does. You wear the best of crests, a crown of perfect peacock plumes. Your dancing glances stun the bees meandering amidst the blooms. You relish love play in a cottage by Kalindi shore. O oh Krishna, may pure love for you be mine forevermore. Hare Krishna. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. He gave up.